all our guests for being here. It is now time for question period. The member from Lambton Kent Middlesex. Thank you uh, very much, Speaker. My question this morning is to the Acting Premier and is regarding the recent election results here in the City of Toronto. By capturing nearly 40 per cent of the vote and winning by a margin of over 64,000 votes, Toronto residents elected a new mayor and ultimately a, a new council with a strong focus on resolving traffic gridlock. <laughs> mayor elect Tory has sent a strong signal that he intends to move forward with big improvements in Toronto's transit infrastructure, including his signature campaign piece called Smart Track. Acting Premier, how does your government plan to work with the new mayor and council to move forward on their House mandate Mayor, to improve Minister transit of Agriculture in Toronto? And the member from the Carlton, come to order, please. Uh, thank you to the, Premier. to the Minister of uh, Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, I thank the member opposite for that question. Uh, I've had the opportunity uh, already uh, to uh, send some correspondence out to Mayor Electori, along with mayors uh, that have been elected right across uh, the GTHA, right across the province of Ontario. Uh, Speaker, uh, I think what's most exciting about the results that we saw that took place, not just in Toronto but right across the region, is how much energy and passion there is with respect to the debates around transit. I look forward to working with Mayor Electori and mayors and councils right across the province so that we can successfully deliver our $29 billion infrastructure plan. Thanks very much. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker. And back to the uh, Acting Premier. Mayor Electori Smart Track plans to deliver a new rail system in the existing GO Train corridor within seven years. It is a London style surface rail subway that moves the most people in the shortest time across the entire city. Tory Smart Track Plan promises 22 new station stops and five interchanges with the TTC Rapid Transit Network. After hearing Premier Kathleen Wynne's hallelujah remarks, we know the Premier is excited to work with the new mayor elect Tory. Is the government planning to implement Smart Track or do you have some other plan? Minister. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. So, as I mentioned in my initial response to this member's question, uh, there is, of course, a great desire on the part of both myself and every member of this government to work very closely with all of our municipal partners so that we can deliver on the ambitious plans that we have for the province's future. Speaker, what's really important to note, not just about the proposed smart track that Mr. that Mayor Electori has put forward, what's really important to note, Speaker, is that in our 10-year plan, we have a very a fundamental piece of that plan that is two-way all-day regional express rail for GO, which will provide up to 15-minute service on all of our GO rail corridors over the next 10 years, electrified service, Speaker. It's something we're very excited about, uh, and there are wonderful opportunities within that plan, from my perspective, for us to be in alignment with not only Smart Track but a number yes, of other positive projects that will benefit communities right across the region. As I said earlier, I look forward to working with all mayors and councils to deliver good results for the Thank people. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, back to the afternoon Premier. Your government has promised $15 billion for Greater Toronto and Hamilton area transit expansion over the next decade, but much of this money is already spoken for and already allocated. The people of Ontario have heard many transit promises from your Liberal government. From two-way all-day GO service to high-speed rail from Windsor to Toronto to a Scarborough subway. If you're going ahead with Smart Track, are these other transit projects a lower priority now? And how do you intend to pay for all of them? Minister. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. So I, I, uh, there's lots of great news on this side of the House, of course, uh, Speaker, with respect to the ambitious plans that we have for the next 10 years. I'm not quite sure where the member opposite's getting his facts or information. What I do know. What I do know, Speaker, is that the Ministry of Transportation and the wonderful team at Metrolinx will continue to work very closely with all mayors, all councils, all other municipally, municipally owned transit authorities so that we can deliver some tremendous results for the people, including, Speaker, the two-way, all-day regional express rail, that transformation of GO trains and GO service right across the GTHA and, and beyond, which, Speaker, will benefit communities like Kitchener, like Milton, like Barrie, and like so many others, Speaker. That's the work that we're focused on. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to be quick with this. Uh, it, uh, the shots back and forth are going to stop. If they're not stopped by you, I'll stop them. It stops now. New question, the member. Thank you very much, Speaker. And my next, uh, next question this morning is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services and is regarding the adoption crisis occurring here in Ontario. Minister, as you know, across uh, Ontario, there are approximately 8,000 children waiting for permanent homes in this province. 
Adoption is a provincially regulated issue and is a lifelong commitment. Minister, do you agree with the Right Honourable Governor-General David Johnston that there is an adoption crisis occurring here in our province? Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Good morning, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Um, and I, I do take my responsibilities on the adoption file very seriously. I know that uh, the number of children who have been adopted in Ontario uh, has continued to increase. We have less and less uh, children uh, waiting to be adopted. We are very focused, in particular, on um, children in the Aboriginal community, Speaker, who, um, where there's perhaps more challenges on, on uh, proceeding with adoptions. But we're working very closely with those communities to make sure things are culturally uh, sensitive and appropriate. So uh, my commitment is to continue to look at the issues and opportunities associated with the adoption file, and I'd be pleased to uh, meet with the member to discuss that more fully. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, back to the minister. Minister, you will know that it is often easier to adopt on other continents than it is to adopt across regional boundaries here in Ontario, because each CAS office operates in a silo within their own territory. In 2009, prior to his appointment, Governor General David Johnson led an expert panel on the adoption crisis. Five years later, the major recommendation remains unfulfilled. Sadly, government red tape and interprovincial barriers often prevent adoptions from other parts of Canada. Minister, this is about children and our society. What can we do to work together to help resolve this crisis and ensure that waiting families are matched with children in need? Thank you, Minister. So again, thank you to the member for the question. And uh, he commented on the role of the children's aid societies in terms of adoptions in Ontario. And we've made tremendous progress in uh, coordinating the efforts of adoption between the CSs. We have actually a reduction in the number of CSs in, in Ontario, and they are working very closely uh, while, while maintaining the protocols that, that have been established for adoptions in Ontario. I understand his point about international versus domestic. I pursued an international adoption myself until I became pregnant with my twins. I'm very familiar with that process as compared to what we have here in Canada and in Ontario. And I think uh, when we look at the file, there's been great progress. Is there more work to be done? Absolutely. Are there some issues associated yes, with sir. adoptions in Ontario? Absolutely. We'll continue to work on that. I'm happy to provide a, a personal briefing on that. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplement. Well, Speaker, uh, back to the Minister. According to the Adoption Council of Canada, it takes up to nine years for someone to navigate the complicated adoption process. The real adoption crisis here in Ontario is that a bloated and broken system is preventing the timely match of waiting families with children in need. Minister, the longer a young child stays in foster care, the harder it is for healthy attachment to begin. As a new father, Minister, it breaks my heart to think of children growing up without a loving home. Minister, November is National Adoption Month. What specific steps are you committed to taking over the next month to help resolve Ontario's adoption crisis? Thank you, Minister. Well, first of all, congratulations to the, the member on being a, as a new father or having a, maybe a second child. I, I'm not quite sure. Um, <laughs> and um, we we know. We know there are some opportunities on the adoption file. I think it's important, though, when we use numbers around the adoption file, that we be very careful because sometimes we're talking about averages where we have to look at the specifics of, of cases. Um, we have an adoption strategy in Ontario. Again, I'm happy to brief the member on that. And uh, our, our, as I said, our particular focus is around the Aboriginal community and uh, helping facilitate more uh, appropriate adoptions in care, making sure those are culturally sensitive. And uh, nothing is more important to me, Speaker, than the future of children in our province. And I will continue to provide the appropriate leadership on Thank this file. Happy to talk to the member further. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the acting premier, or the deputy premier, rather. Uh, when the deputy premier, president of the Treasury Board, got her mandate letter from the premier, she was instructed to, quote, increase the government's accountability and transparency, end quote. Now, does that include ending the government's attempt to cover up what happened with the gas plants by ensuring that Peter Feist and Laura Miller testify at the gas plants committee? 
The Deputy Premier. Uh, Government House Leader. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I thank uh, the, the leader of the third party for, for the question. Uh, Premier, uh, Speaker, I've uh, spoken uh, often uh, in this House about uh, our government's commit commitment uh, to being open and transparent in uh, making sure that uh, we've got uh, uh, principles in place that ensures uh, that there's more enhanced transparency and accountability when it comes to government functions. And that's why, uh, Speaker, we're really proud that we have uh, tabled a, a, a government uh, and MPP uh, or transparency and accountability legislation, which we're hoping that will pass uh, through this House. And also, Speaker, that is why we've been, uh, we've been very clear uh, in, in stating that it is time for the Justice Committee to complete this work. It is time for the Justice Committee to, uh, uh, to start the work of uh, writing its report. Uh, they, uh, the committees have been working for three years. Yes, sir. They've listened to about 90 witnesses. Uh, hundreds and thousands of documents have been considered. It is time for them Thank to you. give some advice. I'm just going to offer a caution as opposed to withdrawal. Please uh, be guarded with your language. It was very close. I appreciate the, the member taking that under advisement. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, you know, the leg legislation means nothing if the government's not prepared to keep their word and start being transparent and accountable to the people of this province. New Democrats fought tooth and nail, Speaker, to get the details about the $1.1 billion gas plant scandal in the first place. We uncovered the facts cancel about the cancelled gas plants, that they didn't cost $230 million, as the Liberals had su suggested, but they in fact costed $1.1 billion. We uncovered that the Liberals put their own political interest first, ahead of the people of Ontario. And we learned that Liberal insiders wiped computers to try to hide evidence from the people. Now, will the minister responsible for accountability and transparency, the head of Treasury Board, will that minister tell her Liberal colleagues on the Gas Plants Committee Question. to be truly transparent and fully accountable to stop hiding the truth and make sure that Laura Miller and Peter Feist actually testify at that committee? Speaker, we have been absolutely clear on this point. We want the Justice Committee to finish its work. Speaker, during, during the campaign, we were very clear that we want the Justice Committee to engage in, in report writing, given the extensive amount of work uh, that the members of that committee has done. And I, rem I remind the leader of the third party, because her question was, uh, I would suggest to Speaker to you, was full of contradictions, because on April 29th, three days, merely three days before the third party decided not to support the budget uh, in this House, the, a member from her own party, the member from Bramley, Gore Martin, uh, Malton, stated, and he moved a motion in the committee stating that the Standing Committee on Justice Policy begin report writing in open session. Speaker, what has changed? I mean, this was three days before a campaign was called, and we agree. I think it is time, Speaker, that we, should, we should get uh, the work on report writing, and I ask the opposition parties to stop stalling the work in the committee, and let's Thank get you. back to work in Justice Committee. Thank you. Final I think it's shameful that the House Leader doesn't tell the whole story when we're talking about accountability and transparency. We absolutely indicated we wanted to continue to have witnesses Minister come to Municipal that committee, and, and that House Minister Leader knows it. Shame on the Liberals once again for twisting the truth. According to police investigator Speaker Peter Feist is at the centre, at the centre of the computer wiping scandal in the Premier's office. And Laura Miller, the Deputy of Chief of Staff of the former Premier, was orchestrating that scheme. Now Ontarians deserve to know what information was so important to the Liberals that they used military. Stop the clock. Come to order. And stay that way. Please finish. Ontarians, Speaker, deserve to know what information was so important to be, to be hidden that the Liberals used military-grade software to make sure it got wiped out. Question. They deserve to know who gave the order, Speaker. And so the question goes back, frankly, to the head of the Treasury Board. In your mandate letter, one more time, I want to, I want to remind that minister that Increasing the government's Thank accountability you. and transparency is her, is her job. When's she going to do it? Oh, Speaker, 
with, with, with all due respect, the kind of uh, uh, allegation and assertions that the leader of the third party is making is something that sh the Justice Committee should not be looking at. That is exactly the kind of stuff that the Ontario Provincial Police is investigating into. We should not insert ourselves in a police investigation. I think it's, that matter should be left up to the police, which is an arm's length investigation uh, from the functions of the government. In fact, the OPP witnesses, when they came to, to the Justice Committee, they, they said the same thing, said, do not engage in work that we are doing. So I asked the members, let's get back to the mandate of that committee, and that is to give guidance to the government as to how decisions around large energy infrastructure should be made. That was the mandate of the committee. That's what we need to focus on. That is why, Speaker, we brought a motion in the standing Committee yes, of the Legislative Assembly to refer uh, Ministry of Energy to the Standing Committee of Justice and Policy so that members there can resume their work. The, Thank the you. members from the opposition are Thank dragging you. their feet. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the uh, Deputy Premier. Does the Deputy Premier and Head of the Treasury Board think that privatizing and outsourcing IT services at an increased cost of $200 million is a good idea? when we can do that same work in-house for much less. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, uh, thank you to the member opposite. I, uh, I welcome the opportunity to clarify some of the uh, erroneous information that has been uh, dropped in this House, Speaker. So it is true that IT we need IT consultants. We need them to provide services and programs that Ontarians need in a cost-effective, um, efficient and convenient way. Ontarians expect our, uh, their services to be, um, to be delivered in a, 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 to be accessible digitally. Uh, we actually have done a very good job reducing our reliance on IT consultants. And I think, uh, Speaker, I think everyone would acknowledge that there are occasions where we actually need to turn to those task-specific consultants, where we don't have the expertise internally, but where we do or do have the expertise internally, we are bringing those uh, uh, consultants into the OPS. Speaker, I'll look forward to the supplement. Thank you. Sure. The Liberal government keeps insisting it's looking for ways to save money and rationalize the way that we run our province. We have IT professionals, but instead of using the professionals who work for the Ontario Public Service, the Liberals have increased the use of outside consultants by 63 per cent in the last five years. Wow. It's just wow. more privatization by stealth and more cost to Ontarian speaker. Does the President of the Treasury Board, responsible for saving money, think that this makes any sense whatsoever? Well, Speaker, I, I can tell you we've worked hard to figure out where that 63 per cent number comes from because it it's simply not true. In yeah. fact, no. you might remember, Speaker, in 2002, the Auditor General delivered a scathing report on the use of IT consultants, and we were elected in 2003. Since then, we have uh, achieved results. We have cut in half our reliance on consultants wow. since that time. Wow. Speaker, uh, around 1,500 consulting, consulting positions, 1,500 consulting positions have been converted to OPS staff, most of which were IT positions. The result has been an ongoing saving of $60 million a year, Speaker. Uh, in fact, we're not done. We've, uh, we're moving to uh, convert an additional yes, IT, IT consultants, a further $3.6 million reduction. So I think we actually agree. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the minister might want to talk about an a, a action from 2003. I'm talking about an Auditor General's review of much more recent history, Speaker. The bottom line is Ontario now has 63 per cent more consultants doing IT work than it did five years ago. Not 11 years ago, Speaker, five years ago. It costs more than double to hire a consultant than it does to do the work in-house. There are more consultants, Speaker, and we're paying them more money. 
Those are just the facts. Now, I can understand if the head of Treasury Board, the former Minister of Health, is having e-health deja vu over there across the aisle. <laughs> Will the head of Treasury Board take the lessons learned from e-health, in fact, stop outsourcing and privatizing IT services, bring them back in-house, and save the people of Ontario $200 million? Okay. Uh, speaker, I'm, I'm one who believes that uh, uh, that people, intelligent, uh, well-meaning people, armed with the same facts, will come to the same conclusion. So I am offering an opportunity to actually make sure that the NDP has the right facts. They have been claiming that the government is spending $700 million a year on IT consultants. It's simply not true. The number, Speaker, was $130 million. What the opposition has done is it has included things like our Microsoft Office licenses in that $700 million. If they think that we should develop our own version of Microsoft Office, I think we Mr. Order. You have time for a wrap-up. Oh, I say I, I, uh, I just simply do not, cannot buy the argument that we should be developing our own internet service within government, Thank our you. own Office, Microsoft Office uh, program. Speaker. Thank you. Question: The member from Renfrew, Nicholson, Pembroke. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Last week, I asked the Premier, whom she deflected, a question on the gas plant scandal. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Last week I asked the Premier. She deflected it to the House Leader. He gave a somewhat dithering obstructionist response to questions with regard to the gas plant scandal and the Standing Committee on Justice Policy, who had been interviewing witnesses. We've asked specifically, and the Premier is quoted in Hansard as saying she wants all the facts to come out at this committee. No, they don't. So we have two witnesses, Laura Miller, Peter Feist, eyewitnesses to the caper. Eyewitnesses, they know who deleted the emails, they know who destroyed documents, and they know who had unauthorized access to the Premier's office. So we've asked, and I'll ask you again, you're in the, you're in the big chair today, make a decision. Okay, will you allow Laura Miller and Peter Feist to come before that committee so that the facts can be known and Thank we you. can put this baby to bed? Seated, please. Thank you. Order. I will now. Uh, I uh, first of all, I didn't recognize you. Second of all, the next person that speaks when I'm trying to get quiet will get uh, warned. Deputy Premier. I apologize, Speaker. <coughs> Government House Leader. Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And again, um, I, I, member from Bruce I observed South the member with order. amusement uh, with, uh, with the, uh, his version of, uh, Leader, of, of logic that he presents. What he's talking about, Speaker, again, is, is member very from Leeds clear, Grenville, come to uh, order. Speaker, that the matters that he's. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Finish, please. Speaker, the matter that he, uh, the, the, the member uh, from Renfrew, uh, Pembroke Nipissing, is, is uh, re referencing the way he's categorizing them are clearly within the purview of the Ontario Provincial Police. As Speaker, as you know, there is an ongoing investigation uh, in that whole matter, and it's up to the OPP to determine as to what next steps should be, uh, they should be taking, uh, Answer. which witnesses they should be talking to. That is not the mandate of the Justice Committee. The mandate of the Justice Committee is look, looking into the decision Thank you. On the relocation of gas plants. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Back to the acting premier. You know, the House leader is a lawyer. He knows that the OPP cannot force Laura Miller or Peter Feist to give a statement, but the, but the committee can if you would allow them to come before this committee. Now, this morning, you tabled for second reading your Bill 8. 
It's, I don't know how many times you use the words accountability and transparency. Well, this is your opportunity to put some action onto those words, not hollow, hollow words which we get, usually get from the Liberal Party. This is a time to stand up and take action. This is the last opportunity. We have an Opposition Day motion today that will call upon this House to bring Laura Miller and Peter Feist before that committee so that we can hear from them, we can get the facts. The Premier will have her completed investigation, we'll get to write that report, but the people of Ontario will not be denied the final adjudication of what happened there, and that is what your actions or your failure to act Thank you. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you again, uh, Speaker. Speaker, I, I want to thank the member from Nepean Carlton for referencing the speech from the throne yesterday. And this is what the speech from the throne says. And to ensure that his decisions are always made responsibly, openly in the best interest of Ontarians, your government will take steps to allow the Justice Committee to write its report. Right. That, Speaker, is coming from the speech from the throne, which, by the way, Speaker, was passed in this very House. And the speech from the throne, Speaker, clearly says that the government will allow the Justice Committee to write its report. We are doing exactly that, Speaker. We have asked the Standing Committee of Legislative Assembly to refer Ministry of Energy to the Standing Committee Answer. of Justice Policy Without so that Andy Justice Kateri. Committee. The uh, Deputy House Leader is warned. Finish, please. You have wrap up. We, we've asked the Justice Committee so that Justice Committee and Speaker can uh, start the process of writing reports and giving its recommendations to the government. Thank you very Thank much. You. New question. The member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Speaker, the, the uh, President of the Treasury Board's mandate letter says she is responsible for, quote, conducting an ongoing review of IT service delivery, including ensuring that costs and expenditures provide value for money. Does the Deputy Premier think that the estimated $350 million spent to construct the Guelph Data Centre, a facility whose services are in fact being contracted out, makes sense? Deputy Premier. Well, thank you, Speaker. And, um you know, I, I really think it's important that the NDP get their facts straight when it comes to the IT. This is very important work, Speaker, and we welcome the criticism and the opposition from the opposition, but, Speaker, it's important that we start with the right facts. So the member opposite has, uh, has said that the government's spending $700 million on consultants. Simply not true. There is a mysterious number floating out there about how much we've increased reliance on consultants. The truth is, Speaker, that we have reduced our reliance on consultants by 50 per cent, saving tens of million dollars, and we know there is more work to do, and we are committed to doing Answer. that work. So, Speaker, the, the Guelph Data Center, the center that the member has uh, referenced is a very important part of Ontario's uh, IT plan. Uh, we, uh, we are very proud of that center. and. Uh, we, uh, I'm not quite sure what her criticism of that is, but uh, we you. are very proud of that uh, data center. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, I'll make my criticism very clear. Mr. Speaker, the minister is supposedly tasked with finding savings and eliminating waste. Right now, it's estimated that the Guelph data center servers are only being used 20 per cent of their capacity. Yet the government is contracting out data storage to privately operated cloud. Now, perhaps it's convenient for that data and those emails to be in a cloud somewhere instead of a secure facility run by the trained, qualified IT professionals in the OPS. But why is this government wasting money by contracting out data storage to the private sector when Ontario already has the capacity to do those services in-house and the people of this province have already paid for it? Well, Speaker, that's, that's exactly what we're doing. We invested a significant amount of money in that data centre. There's another data centre in Kingston, Speaker, and we are consolidating work into those centres. So again, I actually think we agree that the right thing to do is to use the data centres that we have invested heavily in for the best possible value. 
There has been concern about uh, uh, using the cloud, and I think it's important that the member understand that the only information that is on the cloud is actually public-facing information. So our Ontario.ca website, for example, is on the cloud. There is no personal information uh, stored there. Thank you. Question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Speaker, I'm grateful for the hard work of Ontario's correction staff who play such an important role in keeping our communities safe. This is particularly relevant and of considerable concern in my riding of Kingston and the Islands, where we have five correctional facilities. Recently, the minister joined me in Kingston along with a panel of experts from the field of corrections at a town hall event that I hosted at Queen's University. We had experts from a variety of organizations, including the Law Department at Queen's, Youth Diversion, John Howard Society, and, of course, the Federal Correctional Officers Union. I was happy to have the minister and discuss this issue that hits so close to home. Discussions about corrections are important, but what Kingstonians and Ontarians expect to see from our government is action. Mr. Speaker, can the minister Question. please tell us what has been done to take action on this issue? Minister of Community Safety and Corrections. Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for uh, raising a very important issue and her invitation to me uh, to the panel discussion that she hosted at, at Queen's University. Speaker, uh, during introduction of guests, I mentioned that we've got some correctional officers who are visiting, sitting in the, in the public gallery, and through them, uh, Speaker, I want to first of all thank all our correctional officers for their hard work, professionalism, and dedication in keeping our community safe every day. Speaker, our goal is to build a stronger and safer communities. At the roundtable, uh, we discussed uh, the clear mandate that I was, I'm given by the Premier to transform our correctional system. And I discussed, Speaker, the action that we are taking on and addressing capacity issues while working to ensure the safety of all our staff members and our inmates. And also, Speaker, ensuring that support, support for rehabilitation Answer. and reintegration for our inmates is in place to minimize recidivism. I look forward to providing more details in supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. I'm happy to hear that the Minister will be taking action to address the state of our correctional system in Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, we still hear of concerns around mental health services and critical programs to rehabilitate and reintegrate offenders into our communities. Mr. Speaker, these issues are of interest to all Ontarians as they affect recidivism and have an impact on community safety as a whole. That is why it is important that we work together with all of our partners in corrections to address these issues. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, please elaborate on the specific steps that you are taking to address these concerns. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, thank you. Speaker, we are focused on a system that keeps our correctional staff and inmates safe while providing more opportunities for training and rehabilitation. That means continually working to improve conditions at every institution across the province by enhancing education, rehabilitative and training programs for offenders, improving services for mentally ill female and Aboriginal uh, offenders, improving discharge planning and community reintegration, and addressing both capacity and innovation within our correctional system. Speaker, I know that our OPSU partners and all our corrections uh, uh, partners share the same goals. We are already working uh, towards uh, to improve the safety and security of both correctional staff and inmates and are moving on rolling out protective equipment for our correctional officers, developing a regional intermittent and center sir? strategy and hiring over 300 new officers by the end of this year. Not to mention, Speaker, we are hiring more mental health nurses to provide better care for our uh, inmates that are in our care and custody. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Lanark, Farnock, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. Minister, contrary to all your spin, your government is not acting in an open, transparent, nor accountable manner. I'd like to bring to the public's attention an important detail from the Mars audited financial statements. And I quote, in 2011, Mars Phase 2 Inc. exercised an option in the amended ground lease with ARE to sublet the property to Phase 2 Trust thereby enabling it to develop and manage the property. Minister, 
This was immediately after you loaned Mars $224 million to complete phase two. What part of the contract was not amended that has now cost us an additional $65 million, not to mention the Question. millions in interest that we're also paying now? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Well, well thank you, Speaker. And, and I have to say, I, I think the member opposite needs to acknowledge publicly that the building has been valued at or above our investment in that building, Speaker. So again, I ask the member opposite, what the would they have done in the face of a, an economic downturn that uh, caused real challenges for ARE? Would you have left the hole in the ground at the corner of College and University Avenue, or would you have stepped in to do the responsible thing where taxpayers are actually getting an enhanced uh, benefit speaker. So we, we took the steps, we, we are taking steps that are necessary in order to actually have an asset that works for the people of the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Maybe I can have a page bring over the financials for Mars to the uh, minister. Again, uh, Mars makes it quite clear in their financial statements that they revised the phase two agreement with ARE after your government loaned them $224 million. Mars amended the agreement to allow them to both develop and manage the property. Your government has repeatedly stated in estimates that you spent $65 million to buy out ARE phase two operations and management rights. How can you spend $65 million to buy out the ARE contract in 2014 when Mars's own audited statements say they took ownership of that same contract Question. in 2011. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, Speaker, it's very important to us on this side that we are responsible with every single dollar that taxpayers have paid, Speaker. And in order to ensure that we are actually doing the right thing when it comes to the situation at Mars, is we've, uh, we've uh, asked a couple of very prominent people to give us advice on— The, uh, the member will withdraw. Thank you. We have engaged Carol Stevenson, the former dean at the Ivy School of Business Speaker in London, and Michael no Nobrega, the, uh, formerly of Omers, to give us advice on what the right thing to do is. Let me repeat, the value of the building has been on several occasions valued at more than or at or more Answer. than what we have already invested. This is a good deal for Ontario. Good Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. My from Renfrew, is come to order. The Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Merci. Speaker, the Liberal government is undermining our public health care system by allowing secret medical tourism into Ontario. Ontario holds public health care system dear. Frontline health care workers and New Democrats will not stand by and allow it to be dismantled. Allowing people to use their credit card to jump the line goes against every principle of Medicare. It goes against care being based on needs and not on ability to pay. It's time for this Liberal government to end the secrecy and come clean on medical tourism. Will the minister tell Ontarian how many hospitals are already Question. in the business of medical tourism and how many Ontarians have been bumped down the line and forced to wait longer for their Thank care? You. Wow. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. First of all, zero patients have been bumped down the line. I think it's important that we not provide misinformation to Ontarians and that it gives me an opportunity as Minister of Health to be absolutely clear that Ontario patients must and will always come first. And hospitals are not allowed and will not be allowed, Mr. Speaker, to displace any Ontarians in favour of international patients. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to ensuring that 
Ontarians have timely access to the best quality hospital care. And I want to say as well that I want to thank specifically the RNAO, the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, and their partners for flagging this issue and bringing their concerns to me. In fact, I met with their uh, head, Doris Greensp Grinspun, uh, last Monday specifically on this, on this issue. Answer. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to uh, elaborate in the supplementary exactly what measures we've already put in place, Thank as you. well as further measures coming up. Supplementary. Speaker, I can't believe that we have a Minister of Health who would stand in this house and defend medical tourism, defend a system that will undo everything that we have done to make sure that care is based on needs, not on ability to pay. Medicare tourism will create they know as well as we know that medical tourism will create a two-tier system where people with big wallets will jump the queue. This is wrong. This goes against every principle that we hold dear, and they know this. But yet, he stands in this house and defends this. Nurses, doctor, midwives were at Queen's Park today. They are calling for a ban on medical tourism. They are the frontline workers. They can see that the government plan is creating a two-tier system. It is putting profit ahead of patient care. Why won't the minister listen to Ontario and act immediately, ban this medical tourism, and stop the well Thank you. rich people from jumping the queue? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I quite frankly don't know where to begin. This idea that the member opposite has that somehow these patients are jumping the queue is absolutely not true. The, the, the allegation that she suggests that this somehow is affecting the patient care of Ontarians is absolutely not true. But the truth is, Mr. Speaker, is that when I first had this conversation with the RNAO and others, I began a review process in through my own ministry. We sent a survey out to the hospitals, which are actually engaged in some way or thinking of being engaged in, in international patients. We sent out a survey to get more information. Uh, we're reviewing the results of that survey. I mentioned that I met with RNAO as recently as last Monday on this as well. I take their concerns very, very seriously, but Mr. Speaker, I have to say that we have already implemented measures where zero public doctor dollars can be used to pay for this type of Answer. care. Ontario patients must and will always come first, Mr. Speaker, and any revenue generated has to go back into hospitals to improve patient care. But we are looking at Thank this, you. and we'll have further information later. No question. The member from the Tropical Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister, during the election campaign, I met with thousands of constituents, and they raised a range of issues. And one of the things that they raised was that many of them have family members who are struggling with developmental disabilities, and they need help. In my riding of Etobicoke Centre, we have, we're fortunate to have organizations like Community Living that provide support to, their, to those families and those individuals. But since becoming MPP, I have heard very clearly more support is needed for people and their families of those who, who have dis developmental disabilities. Advocates have asked for more specialized care that, is targeted to, that are targeted to individual goals and needs. And I know in this House we, had, we heard calls for greater support uh, yesterday when the report for the Select Committee on Developmental Services was tabled yesterday. I know that through the budget, the government has chosen to prioritize and invest further to support those with developmental disabilities. Question. Minister, could you tell us who will benefit from these investments and how this will impact the lives of those individuals and their families? Thank you. Minister of Community and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Etobicoke Centre for this question. And I was certainly proud to rise in the House yesterday in response to the Select Committee on Developmental D Disabilities uh, uh, report and to detail the many actions our government continues to take in this area. As we transform developmental services in this province, our goal is to ensure that everyone can participate fully in our communities. The 2014 budget placed a further emphasis on this transformation through our $810 million investment, the single largest investment in the developmental services sector in the province's history. This investment is expanding direct funding to serve 21,000 more individuals and families. Specifically, we will be supporting 8,000 children and their families through special services at home and 13,000 hours. 
Sir. through the passport program. In this way, we will provide more choice and flexibility within the existing system to better promote inclusion, independence and choice. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. And I'm sure those people impacted will, will appreciate this, this significant investment. Minister, yesterday you mentioned that the government was exceeding its projected targets in providing direct funding supports for individuals with developmental disabilities and to their families. However, as you know, there are, in some cases, individuals, both adults and children, continue to wait for funding from these programs, and this includes constituents in my own riding of Etobicoke Centre. Getting access to these funds so that individuals can start to enjoy more programming and support is obviously critical and top of mind to these people and their families. Minister, how is the, how is the, Minister, how is the government tackling these wait lists, and when can these adults and children in Etobicoke Centre beyond expect to enjoy that support? Good question. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We committed in the budget to eliminate the current wait list for the direct funding program programs, passport and special services at home, and our government is making significant progress as thousands of people are already benefiting from our budget investment. Since our budget passed in July of this year, 7,900 people and their families have been approved for direct funding, exceeding our original targets for this year by at least 20 per cent. We're already more than 35 per cent toward our goal to provide direct funding to 21,000 people. We also, as of October 1st, updated the eligible services and supports eligible for funding under passport so adults with a developmental disability can get temporary respite for their caregivers, take part in community classes, recreational programs, develop work, volunteer, Answer. daily life skills, hire a support worker and create the, their own life plans to reach their goals. Thank you. The question member from Halliburton Court for its block. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Minister, let me quote from your mandate letter from the Premier. Continue to work with the tourism industry and regional tourism organizations to support the sector's economic growth and encourage collaboration among tourism industry partners. Minister, a report by Fred Lazar of the Sherlock School of Business at York University finds that increasing the aviation fuel tax in Ontario could mean a loss of nearly 3,000 jobs and decrease provincial GDP by almost $100 million annually. So my question to you is what economic analysis have you done on the impact to job and revenue losses that this aviation tax will cause? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Finance. Sir Finance. Well, I appreciate the question. As you know, aviation fuel um, is impacted not just by what the province of Ontario has uh, just recently applied. It hasn't even changed since 1992. The majority of the fees associated with uh, the airlines is actually a federal component. Notwithstanding that, Mr. Speaker, we also recognize that Ontario has benefited from greater runs, greater airline investments, and, uh, and more opportunities in, in the province. We also have mitigating opportunities in some of the remote communities that we'll be looking at, and we look forward to continuing to enhance tourism and activity. Thank you. Who's Who's next? No, for the warning. <laughs> Supplementary. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Minister, in July, Sunwing announced that they will begin to operate flights out of Buffalo instead of Pearson International Airport, largely to avoid the increased costs. Just last week, officials were here from Buffalo International Airport launching a campaign to attract travelers south of the border. They have bought ads on The Gardener, they are running TV commercials, and have a website to emphasize the potential savings to Ontarians. Uh, you like to point out and blame other levels of government, but the bottom line here is your government's aviation fuel tax increase is bad business here in Ontario. So, Minister, uh, are you not concerned at all that this increase uh, in taxes is driving businesses and travellers out of Ontario? Are you not at all concerned? Mr. Speaker, we are stimulating and investing in our economy to promote greater growth and greater opportunities and maintaining a very competitive business climate, including uh, the areas around tourism. And here's what the Buffalo Airport senior marketing manager noted. He said the following, and I quote, 
He, like many other residents of Western New York, will use the Toronto airport to fly to international destinations. We recognize that Toronto and Pearson is a very competitive airport, and we will continue to be so when, uh, when we look at other airports and other opportunities around the world. We are an international hub. And it's still more effective to operate from west from from Toronto and the surrounding regions in Ontario. What's also important to note, Mr. Speaker, is that there are increased investments and increased flights coming out of Ontario yes, than ever before, Mr. Speaker. And we will continue to enhance and support that. Thank you. New question, the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last month, the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services informed me that male offenders from Windsor and Chatham serving intermittent sentences would report to London rather than the new $247 million facility in their own community. As you know, conditions at the London facility are deplorable, with constant instances of overcrowding, understaffing and lockdowns. With the minister now announcing plans to build a new facility in London, will male offenders from Windsor be required to report to this new facility, or does the minister ever plan to allow male intermittent sentences to be served at the Southwest Detention Centre? Thank you, Minister of Community Safety and Corrections. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member from Windsor West for asking the question. And I'm very much looking forward to working with the member on uh, very important issues dealing with community safety and correctional services. I've appreciated our conversations, uh, Speaker, uh, thus far on, on issues, and particularly the issues that, uh, that she has raised in regards to Elgin Middlesex Detention Center. Uh, Speaker, as I've uh, spoken in the House before, I've had the opportunity to visit uh, EMDC uh, along uh, with our, our superintendent and uh, the members of the of the, the members of the local union and and that of the the provincial uh, union as well to better understand the kind of challenges and solutions that we need to determine uh, uh, together. And as a result, uh, uh, Speaker, we are not only implementing uh, the 12-point action plan that my predecessor, uh, the Attorney General, uh, put into into action, and 11 out of those 12 are already uh, already been action. But we are also have announced uh, the building of a new regional intermediate. Uh, uh, detention center uh, so that we can separate intermittent inmates Thank from uh, those who are sentenced. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I don't believe I actually received a, uh, an answer to my question as to whether Windsor and Chatham intermittent offenders will then be returned to Windsor. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we also learned from the Minister during his recent tour of EMDC in London that one of the reasons that Southwest Detention Centre in Windsor isn't fully operational is because it's currently understaffed, thereby male intermittent offenders are being sent to the EMDC in London, and we all know how successful that has been. In fact, the frequent lockdowns on the weekends at EMDC are due to staff shortages, leading to volatile ongoing situation there. Minister, short staffing of correctional facilities is not just a problem in Windsor, it's not just a problem in London, but across the entire correctional system in this province. It's a health and safety issue for the staff and a safety and service issue for the offenders. The minister mentioned hiring 300 officers. Windsor alone would take up one-fifth of who you plan to hire for this Question. entire province. What will the minister do to fix the problem of staff shortages at existing correctional facilities and ensure all new facilities are adequately staffed? Thank you. Uh, Speaker, we are really proud of the state-of-the-art uh, detention center that has been built in Southwest uh, in Windsor, uh, called the Southwest Detention uh, Center. Speaker, we are even prouder of the fact that we worked very closely with our correctional staff, both management and correctional officers, in terms of the design and uh, the operation of the Southwest Detention uh, Center, so that not only we uh, we enhance the health and safety of our correctional staff, uh, but also the safety of inmates. Uh, as well. Uh, speaker, um, the Southwest Detention Center right now is at 80 percent capacity. The reason it is at 80 percent capacity is, is by plan, because we want we have a transition plan. We want to make sure uh, that uh, you, don't just, you don't just open a jail and just fill it up with people. We, uh, the health and safety of our correctional staff, both managers and correctional officers, is extremely important. So we want to make sure that there is a plan, yes, that there is proper transition in place. As for intermittent from Windsor to AMD, Speaker, we're only talking about four to six individuals only, uh, but I look Thank forward you. to continue working with the member opposite. Thank you. Thank you. Question, the member from Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, as I am sure you and most members of this House are aware, flu season has begun in Ontario. My constituents in the riding of Durham are concerned about 
how easy it is to catch the flu. Sneezing and coughing, lack of hand washing, and children playing at school all make it easy for and inevitable for us to get sick this season. Sometimes the individuals who are most vulnerable to the flu, like the seniors in my riding, can, uh, can experience awful complications such as new, pneumonia. Speaker, through you, I ask the, the minister, what is the government is doing? What is the government doing to stop the spread of influenza this season? Thank you, Minister of Health, Health and Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for, from Durham for this uh, very timely question. And yes, the flu season is here, and that's why Ontario is once again offering a flea, a flea, a free. <laughs> Let's say that three times fast. A free flu shot, Mr. Speaker, for everyone six months of age and older who lives, works, or goes to school in the province. As of last week, the free flu vaccine, I'm not going to get that wrong, was made available at doctor's offices and at community and workplace flu immunization clinics. I even kicked off the beginning of the season last Thursday by giving a flu shot to Galen Weston, who is the executive cha chairman and president of Loblaws at one of the downtown Loblaws pharmacies. And he said he didn't feel a thing. This was to promote the fact that you can now get your flu shot from a trained pharmacist at almost 2,400 pharmacies Answer. across Ontario. And each year, the flu shot prevents the need for 200,000 emergency visits, 30,000, so rather 30,000 visits to hospital ERs, 200,000 to doctors' offices. Thank and I'm you. looking forward to the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Sure you do. The uh, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, through you, I wish to thank the minister. It is great to know that the flu shot will be so easily available for my constituents to access this year. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, I will be taking my flu shot next week in Port Perry at the local Shoppers Drug Mart. My constituents in Durham are, extre are extremely involved in their community, which makes the spreading of flu even easier. Healthcare professionals suggest getting lots of rest, fluids, and hand washings are methods to prevent the spreading of the flu. But we all know this can prevent the spread of flu on its own. I am often hearing people say that they won't need a flu shot this year because they had one last year. Another thing I hear is that the flu shot can actually cause the flu. Speaker, I wish to ask the minister, through you, is there any truth to these rumors? Yes, sir. Well, and Mr. Speaker, before I begin to answer that, I want to also, like the fact that we have so many pharmacists here today as well. Last year, they actually administered almost three quarters of a million vaccines, flu vaccines to Ontarians, and I know it's going to be even more this year. But I'm happy to set the record straight so that Ontarians are informed about the flu and the flu shot. It's simply not true that you can get the flu from the flu shot. It's also a myth that you don't need a shot every year. It's because flu strains can change annually so that the vaccine that you got last fall or winter may not protect you this year. And it's especially important for those who are at high risk of flu-related complications, Mr. Speaker, including the elderly, young children, and those with weakened immune systems. The flu vaccine is safe, effective, and free for all Ontarians over six months of age. And as a physician, I strongly encourage every Ontarian to roll up their sleeve and help stop the spread of the flu this year. Here, Thank you. Here. Question. The leader of the Massachusetts Board of Opposition. My question is for the Minister, Minister of Affairs and Housing. Minister, as you know, on June 17th of this year, a devastating F2 tornado uh, ripped through uh, the township of Essa, creating a path of destruction from the village of Angus to the southwest corner of the municipality. Homes were destroyed, people were displaced, and the municipality incurred substantial costs to assist residents and help with the cleanup. In fact, uh, Mayor Terry Dowdle estimates that there was over $10 million in damages. So, Minister, uh, you sent a letter to the municipality uh, just recently, uh, and you turned down uh, their application for disaster relief under the program. You give them zero dollars. There were over 100 homes destroyed. People were displaced. The township itself had, as you know, over $55,000 overtime costs and yet no assistance. Why aren't you able to provide that assistance? Thank you, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's a good question, and it deserves a straight-up and good answer. But before I give that answer, I just want to take a, 
a moment to thank the honourable member opposite who asked the question uh, for being uh, with us yesterday, standing with us in Hamilton as uh, our community grieved the loss of a great Canadian hero. Jim, appreciate you being there, sir. <clears throat> I uh, want to commend uh, the people of uh, Essa Township and, uh, and Angus for uh, their response, the first responders and the, uh, and the municipal responders. Uh, in fact, the community's response uh, to the events in July uh, demonstrated just what a caring uh, and generous uh, uh, set of community partners were there. Uh, most of the damage uh, <coughs> that was caused was covered uh, by insurance, most Answer. of the was covered by insurance, and that was the case in uh, in this particular instance. I could give more details in the supplemental. Supplementary. Well, it's hard to give my usual supplemental with those kind comments from the, uh, <laughs> from the minister. Uh, I will ask you something, though, seriously. I try not to be partisan about it, but it's my first time I've ever asked this in 24 years. I have an article from the Barry Examiner that says no tornado relief coming, and it hints that the reason we're not getting any relief with up to $10 million in damages is because it's a Tory blue riding. So I hope that's not the case, Minister. I trust that's not the case. I hope ministers don't aren't saying that privately to people. The mayor certainly has indicated in this article that that might be the case, and the author of the article indicates that. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to clear that up. I hope you're not discriminating against my riding because they vote the right way. The, uh, Minister? Clear. Political pedigree has nothing to do with old draft decisions. There, there are a number, number of members on this side of the House and the opposite side of the House who uh, qualified for old draft assistance, and when those requirements were met, that assistance was provided. Uh, as I said uh, in the response to the first part of the question, the vast majority was covered uh, uh, by insurance. Overland flooding often isn't, but tornadoes are invariably covered. Uh, the total damages fr from the old draft application that the township made uh, was, in fact, uh, uh, expenses in the neighbourhood of about $77,000. The community itself uh, generously raised over $140,000. Wow. So the township doesn't need the money, yes, they don't need the money because the colleagues in their community were so generous in helping their neighbours, and we should celebrate that. Thank you. Your question, member from Alcoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to you. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Yesterday was Meet the Miners Day at Queen's Park. You had the same briefing and attended the same reception as I did. The message was loud and clear. Industry told us that due to uncertainty, instability, uncompetitive energy prices, and lack of framework, the mining sector in this province is suffering. Industry told us when they went abroad looking for investment dollars, investors said no. Ontario was not a good investment. When industry came to government for help, they got nothing. When First Nations asked to be included, they were excluded. Mining companies all across this province are suffering. They are asking for stability. They are asking for competitive energy prices. They are asking for a framework in order to do business here and abroad. Will this government help the mining sector in Ontario or continue Russian. to sit on the sidelines and watch as they leave one by one? I regret we won't get a supplementary question, but may I say, I, I think you and I may have been at very different meetings and perhaps at a, we had a different reception. That was one of the most positive gatherings of the mining sector here, here. we've seen in, in a number of years at Queen's Park. There are no question. We recognize there are a number of challenges, and there are no questions that the mining industry, particularly those that were there yesterday, made it clear how important certainty is. But the also the story is, a very important part of the story is, despite those challenges, despite the, they're working closely 
policy with our government on a number of measures. Despite all those challenges, we are still the top jurisdiction in Canada for mineral exploration and for mineral production. Despite those challenges, we have we have our $9.8 billion in mineral production last year. New mines opening up next year, new mines opening up the year, other 10 new mines opening up in the last 10 years. So while there are many challenges, we continue to work closely with all the mining sector, but in a very positive way, moving forward on, on all Answer. aspects of the mining sector, including the Ring of Fire. Yeah, yeah. The uh, member from Stormont, Dundas, and South Glenglary on a point of order. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I just want to quickly see some uh, residents up from Eastern Ontario, Judy Wilcox, Donna Lowen, and Leona uh, St. John here from the riding next. So welcome, please clap. Welcome. We have a deferred vote on the motion of second reading of Bill 18, an act to amend various statutes with respect to employment and labour. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
Would all members take their seats, please? All members take their seats, please. On October the 20th, 2014, Mr. Flynn moved second reading of Bill 18. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Magby. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Di Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkison. Mr. Balkison. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Jas. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerlock. Ms. Domerlock. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGee. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Nadu Harris. Mr. Nadu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McCloud. Mr. McCloud. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Her Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Ms. Denova. Ms. Denova. Mr. Angelina. Mr. Angelina. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Chimino. Mr. Chimino. Ms. French. Ms. French. I'm supposed to say this. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 97, the nays are zero. The ayes being 97 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Pursuant to order of the House dated October the 28th, the bill is ordered to refer to the Standing Committee on General Government. We have a deferred vote on a motion for allocation of time on Bill 15. Call in the members, this will be same vote? No. Thank you. Call in the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
move slower. On October the 28th, Mr. Bradley moved government notice of motion number six. All those in favor, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Hey. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. <laughs> Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sanders. Ms. Sanders. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Padre. Mr. Padre. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkus. Mr. Balkus. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Darmerlo. Ms. Darmerlo. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Martins. Mrs. Martins. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Ver Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. <laughs> All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Madame Jelinat. Madame Jelinat. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Chimino. Mr. Chimino. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 53, the nays are 44. The ayes being 53 and the nays being 44, I declare the motion carried. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.